So the challenge, as I mentioned, was that we have got to find a way to, to line up the two holes or the two ears on a sign plate, as we call them. And how are we going to do it? Well, I've decided to make a tool, a very simple tool, that is maybe six, seven, eight inches long with a few slots in it. And we're going to make that back there on the, on the lathe. And we're going to grind it. And then we're going to show you how it fits and how it works. So, Glenn, what say we go in the back and let's get started on a lathe? Sounds good. All right, let's go. Okay. Here we are putting the, uh, the shaft in the, in the lathe, as you can see, in a three-jaw chuck. This is a, a, a tool that we're going to be making to use on our sign plate to locate the ears, uh, the, the one ear against the other one, which is they're about five inches apart. So that's a little bit of a challenge to make sure that we can pick it up in the jig grinder. So anyway, I, as you can see, we just faced off the, uh, at the end. We'll center drill it which is what we're going to be doing right, right about now. And uh, there we go, nice and easy, nothing to it. This is a, a LeBlanc lathe that's been around a long time. It's, it's a good lathe, but it's, uh, it's had substantial use to it, but it's still, it's still working pretty good. So we're, you know, we're okay with it. It holds size uh, for what we need. The, the accuracy is plenty good. Uh, here we are. I'm going to take the part out, I'm going to mark it uh, with a red crayon because, uh, there you go, now you can see the red crayon mark. Now, we're going to turn the diameter down, and we, do, we don't have a specific size, it doesn't really matter. All I need is, I need it to be true and concentric when we start to uh, grind it on the, uh, on the OD grinder. So again, uh, for the purposes of the tool that we're making, the diameter only has to be small enough to fit into one of the ears, and I'll show you that when we take it out on the jig grinder and actually use it. So you, you, didn't, you can't see what I'm doing uh, behind the scenes here, but I have one of our sign plates uh, with the ears on it, and I'm turning the diameter down, I'll take it out of the lathe and check it, make sure that it goes in the hole. And uh, again, you can't see that, but it's, it's not something that we need to take a look at it at the moment anyway. When this thing is all done, that's really what's important. And again, the concentricity uh, is going to be very, very important. That's why this part will go out to be hardened, uh, and then we'll get it back and we'll take it over on the uh, OD grinder, and we'll finish it up over there. And we'll finish up all the diameters, of which I think we have three. So as soon as we're done turning here, we'll turn it over and... Uh, and finish it up. We've got to, we've got to turn the center down a little bit. And, and do I have to do that? Yes, uh, I need to do it because I don't want to turn the whole thing and make the whole thing thin. I, I'd rather have some beefiness and some stock in there. And I view that as, as uh, in my view, it's important to keep it as large as possible. That way the uh, this little fixture that we're making has more stability than it would have if, if it were too small or smaller I should say and we're just taking a finish cut here which is not again it's not a critical point we don't need to have a strong a good looking finish it, we just need the part to be turned down in, uh, to some diameter that again works and fits in the gear so there we go. And by the way, that's me running the lathe, although I don't think we get a shot. I think we get a shot of me later on, don't we, Glenn? Yes, we do. Yeah, I think we get a shot. But, uh, you know, as a toolmaker, I was a lathe hand as well. You had to do it, you know, back in those days, you had to be uh, an all-around machinist. So I was, uh, I, I, I did Bridgeport work. I did uh, horizontal milling work. Uh, we used to make helical gears uh, and splines. And those we did on the uh, uh, on the horizontal mill. So, <clears throat> part of my training and part of my experience was uh, pretty much machining all the way around. Here I'm just moving that up. I'm taking a rag with it because the damn thing's a little on the warm side, and I don't like burnt fingers. It's not fun. Now there, it's not quite as hot, but oops, get your fingers out of there. It's hot. So I'm using a steady rest here, not a steady rest. I'm using a 
uh, a live center and uh, to support it, uh, when you stick it out that far, you really do need to have a, a live center or at least a dead center, but you need something to support the back end. And I'm going to be turning this down a little bit. Now, you saw me snug that up. That locks the, uh, the tailstock uh, uh, in position and uh, locks the spindle as well, of course, so it, it can't move. You can see the live center turning there. Uh, and again, we're just going to take a, a pass here. And one of the things I, you know, you really need to pay attention to is if you look at that, uh, the, the carbide insert and the tool holder itself, it's important that you don't crash it into the chuck because that's never a happy day and your boss doesn't like that. Not only does it ruin, uh, the, the, it'll probably ruin the, uh, uh, the, the bit, but probably the support for the bit and maybe even the tool holder itself, or it could possibly damage a chuck or maybe even more serious. So I, I can't emphasize how important it is that you have stops set up so you know that you're not going to run into the chuck. Uh, I've done enough lathe work. I did not set up a stop. It wasn't that important. I just needed to be close. So uh, it doesn't bother me to do it, but I think an inexperienced guy needs to be very cautious and certainly set up a stop so you don't run it into the chuck, guys. That's just not good. All right, so now we've, uh, we've gotten it back from heat treat, uh, and we're going to take it over to the OD grinder. And right now, I'm trying to get the taper out. And you'll see that I remember I move it from the right side to the left side until I get it just right. And once I get the taper out, then I'm good to go. So I'll turn it around here and see if we got the taper out by grinding the dog. That's better than grinding the part, folks. And yes, can you put an indicator on the wheel, stop the wheel and do that? You can, but in my view, uh, that that's a little unnecessary. I, I like this way much better. You don't have to fool around getting an indicator out and somehow affixing it to the wheel and then the wheel turns on you. Or, well, you know, it's just a whole lot easier. Or you can use a magnetic base and put it on the spindle itself or up on the on the wheel guard. But again, I get the taper out without grinding the part, uh, and we've got a video on that if you want to take a look at it. And I think that's what it's called, is how to get the taper out of an OD grinder. So check that one out. You'll find it's pretty cool. So now, why am I grinding this diameter? Why not the, uh, why not the other end? Well, this happens to have the most meat on it. And this is the largest part. So I want to, well, second from the largest, actually. So I want to <clears throat> remove as much stock as I can just to get it cleaned up and then I'll go back and do the minor diameter and then the other minor diameter it's not quite as minor that's on the other end and that's really our working end of the gauge that's the one that size is critical this size here is insignificant what's important is concentricity so we've got to have concentricity on all three diameters that's very very important and when we put this tool to work I'm going to show you why that's important so I'm going to take a cut here and what I did was I fed in all the way. It looks like it's going to take about maybe 12 thousandths to clean it up. I fed in all 12 thousandths and I walk across nice and slow. So I, I let the wheel on the edge do the cutting, which is my philosophy. And you'll see where the sparks are. You see it's probably about a third of the way up the wheel. And uh, th that wheel is worn that much. But all of that is working now from that one third to the right is actually doing the cutting. And that's the way it's intended to be used. When the wheel, when that chip on the wheel or that uh, piece of alundum on the wheel gets dull, and we do have a video on that, by the way, as well as about uh, grinding on the OD grinder. And when that gets dull, it'll break off. And when it breaks off, its new neighbor comes in and takes over and does the cutting till it breaks off. So that's why it's important that you pick and select the right wheel, the right hardness of the wheel, and the right grain. In this case, I think this wheel is a as I recall, I think it's a 46 uh, H or I, which I think is a little bit too soft, frankly. And the finish is okay. I, I would prefer a 60, but you get less heat with this wheel. And it's so from that standpoint, it's probably a good choice. But again, for everyday <clears throat> OD grinding for me, uh, 60 I is a wheel that I would prefer to use rather than a 46. 
But again, it works fine. And uh, again, the finish is pretty darn good, so I was good with that. I'm moving the coolant around here because I like to keep the coolant right on the cutting edge. And uh, the rest of it will trail behind, you know, but, but really you want to keep the, uh, the part cool. And the heat is generated, obviously, where the chips are, where you see the sparks. So I like to keep that part as cool as possible. So I focus the coolant on, on the area where the cutting is being done. Again, you can see here where it's starting to clean up. It's not quite cleaned up all over yet, but it's getting close. So when it came back from heat treat, it was a little bit out of round, but that's the nature of the beast. That's what happens when it comes back from heat treat. It's never round. That's why you grind it. And uh, why did we heat treat it? Well, we, we wanted it hard for several reasons. Uh, mainly is because we want, we want to be able to be sure and give this tool as much life as possible. Could we have done something else to it? Yeah, we could chrome it. Uh, we could have it uh, coated with ceramic. There's other things we could do, but for the purposes of, of uh, its intended use, just having it hardened is plenty good. And what does hardened mean? Well, it's probably hardened around 62, 64 Rockwell. That's generally what we, what we have our uh, component parts hardened to. So my guess is that this part is around in, the, in that area. Can't cut it with a file, folks. Can't cut it on a lathe. Well, you could with, with diamond tools, but that takes a certain special lathe that has the rigidity. And then with, with those kind of tools, it's hard to take off tents, frankly. You can take off thousands, but when you get down to trying to take off a few tents, that's kind of tough to do. There's a lot of push, you know, from your cutter against the part. So uh, you, get, you get a lot of flex, and then it's hard to take the part. And sometimes it'll gouge, and then you get... Anyway, that's a whole other... That's a whole other video, but I like uh, I like finishing it on the OD grinder, and that's oh see a spark there. Uh, now we're not hitting the tailstock. Remember, we just rebuilt this tailstock. Uh, the center has a flat spot in it, so I'm moving in to increase that flat spot on the center so I can get the part out. As you can see, the part's not quite off the wheel yet, although it's pretty close. And now I'm going to take it out. And then I'm going to move the wheel and get it out of the way because otherwise it would hit the tail side. This is really tight in there. There's uh, not much margin for error. And I don't think I showed it here, but uh, I ground this again. I, I did a rough cut, and then I turned around and took a finish cut. So I'm checking here not for size, but for straightness. And I... I think I liked it there. I, as I recall, I think that that was pretty good. Yeah, it might have had a little bit of tape on it. I don't know if it did. I know, I know, I took it out. And at some point, we're going to grind the other end. We've got one more side to grind yet, and that's a major diameter. That's actually going to be the part that's critical, or the size that's critical, because it's going to go in the ear of the sign plate. And you're probably wondering, well, what the heck is the ear? I'll show you what the year is at, at, uh, at the right time. The first thing I want to show you here is that we're, we're going to uh, obviously grind this part. Now here we go, we're going to grind the other end. And this is a skinny one. So I found when you're grinding a thin diameter like that, that the parts, you think it'd be, it would stay straight? No, it's going to warp. It's going to go out around a little bit. So that other diameter that we just ground will have to be touched up. It'll probably take another half thousand or so to clean that up. So I'm going to have to go back in and touch that up at some point. Uh, and I don't know if I show that on the video. It doesn't matter. The point is I did do it. So again, take a rough cut, then do your minor diameter, go back and do your major diameter again. You should not have to do the minor uh, again it, it, because you've already broken a scale. Remember, when the parts heat treated, there's a scale on there and it's stressed. So when you relieve the stress, that's why the part tends to move a little bit and go out around. So as we grind this part, uh, I'm looking here to see what it's going to take to clean it up because I don't want any uh, what we call witness marks on there. That, that's to show that we used to use witness marks when the, the lathe hand gave us a part that was undersized and we didn't have enough stock to clean it up. So we used, we'd stop there at the size and say, okay, we got a witness mark here, we're going to show the lathe hand, you didn't give us enough stock. Why didn't he? Well, in some cases, he had enough on there, but when it went out to heat treat and came back 
a little warped, it wasn't enough to clean it up. So part of that could be the heat treat's fault. You know, they're supposed to straighten this stuff within certain tolerances, uh, generally five to 10,000, something like that. So if the lathe hand left 20, 25,000 on there, you're probably good. Uh, and if the heat treat uh, did their job, you're good. But if either one of them uh, didn't have enough, uh, uh, well, if the heat treat didn't straighten it enough and the, uh, the lathe hand didn't leave enough stock on there, well, the combination of the two gives you a bad part and guess what you got? You got a scrap part and start all over again. Not a good thing to do. So, looks like we're just about off the part and uh, then we still have to turn it around and do the other side. And what I didn't talk about here is the other side. And again, we're touching the center there. We're not touching the tailstock. You see that? So that's not the tailstock, folks. That's a, that's the tailstock we just rebuilt. We don't want to we don't want to grind that anymore. That was ground to, to smithereens before we rebuilt the thing. If you look at that video, you'll see what the thing really looked like before we decided to go ahead and rebuild the tailstock. <clears throat> again, this is really tight quarters. I had to move uh, the whole table away. Had I just released the tailstock tension, it would have gone right into the wheel, so I had to move it out of the way. And the other end, which unfortunately we didn't get a really good shot of it, uh, has four slits in it, and it's got a tapered center uh, at, at that end. And we'll show you how we put it together later. But the the idea of having the, the, the slots in there is to allow this arbor to expand. This is really an expanding arbor. That's what it is. And this is tight, I gotta tell you. I, I was the only way I could grind that was to back the wheel all the way off and come in and and uh, no and, and back the wheel all the way off and then come in. <coughs> and try to find it each time. So I couldn't get it out of there because the part would not come off the wheel. So I'd have to grind it and back the wheel away. All right, so here I'm pushing on the headstock. Now, believe it or not, we're, I'm trying to take off a couple of tents. And as rigid as you think this machine is, and here's another one I'm, I'm pushing, pulling on here. I'm not sure what I'm doing, which one, but I think I was pulling. In fact, I know I was. I was pushing because it was a a bit big on the inside edge and a bit small on this edge and the reason that that, that happened is because remember I mentioned there are four slots in the end of this thing so as big as this machine is believe it or not you can push pull click click and it will move albeit not much but it doesn't take much remember 50 millionths is really a tenth because you're grinding both sides anyway here I am I put it on the ring gauge I got a nice slip fit in there and I'm, yeah, I'm happy smile. with it right there. <laughs> nice so there you are, folks. I got a big thumbs, thumbs up right up. there. Good job, nice slip fit. Yeah, baby. All right. I'm proud yeah. of myself. Yeah. So I came up with the concept of this shaft, which is not very novel, but nonetheless, it will work. So what we're doing here is we have ground this shaft concentric, and we made this a slip fit into the first hole that we ground. We also put some slits in here, which I did not show you because I was going to do those on a surface grinder with a cutoff wheel, only to find out that we actually did this in our Mazak CNC. We have a little tiny saw that goes in there and cuts this and puts this taper in here. So there's a taper in that hole. Can you get a good shot of that, Glenn? And there's a screw with a taper washer on it. Let me see if I can hold that up for you, which is what that is. So that taper fits inside here like that. And this is threaded, so the screw goes inside like so. So when we tighten it, because of the slots, it expands it. So just to give you an idea what it looks like, we put that inside here like so. I can snug this up. I will then be able to set this up on a jig grinder up against this face and up against here and I'll be able to come in here with an indicator and tram this 
and I know it'll be in line with the first hole. So that's how we're going to set it up and how we're going to grind this hole concentric with the first hole using this simple little fixture uh, that I would call an expandable arbor. And we made it in such a way that we can get it out like so. So this is going to be elevated a little bit so we can get it out like that. So that, my friends, is how we're going to do it. So we'll look forward to taking you back there and showing you how we make this thing work.